And welcome to our premiere edition of Flap TV, where the area's largest Facebook group dedicated to politics, Fitchburg Lemonster All Politics, makes the jump from your computer screen to your television screen. Each week, we will be joined by two guest panelists. For our premiere episode, we are very honored to have with us the mayor of the city of Fitchburg, Stephen Di Natale, and state representative Natalie Higgins of Lemonster. Each episode will have the same format, five people, three issues and only 30 minutes so we have a lot on our plate so let's get right to it issue one the ongoing and worsening opioid crisis drug overdoses are now the leading cause of death in the united states accidental deaths in fact it's getting so bad that last year overdoses accounted for more deaths than car accidents and gunshot wounds combined unfortunately the twin cities are not immune from this epidemic there have already been dozens of overdoses and multiple fatalities in the Lemons to Fitchburg area just in the first few months of this year. So with limited resources for what appears to be an unlimited crisis, where and what should we be doing on the local level to combat this crisis, which if it continues at its current rate, is threatening to wipe out a whole generation? Cindy. Okay, well, I've thought about this long and hard. Um, we all know somebody who's been affected by this. We've lost loved ones, friends, family uh, to this crisis, and it's ongoing. Every day we read about it in the paper, and it's somebody we know, somebody that we know, their family or relative, and they're just you know dealing with this on an ongoing basis. So I think nothing should be off the table for this. Everything needs to be looked at, um, everything from rehabs to other solutions such as medical marijuana. I've thought a lot about that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, new studies that are showing that if medical marijuana was available for pain management, opiates w wouldn't even be needed. And it can also be used to treat the uh, symptoms of coming off of opioids. Um, we need to look at that. Our state isn't quite there yet uh, with the medical marijuana, and I think we've got a, a long way to go, but that's a, an option that we should definitely look at and have on the table um, amongst others. Representative Higgins. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on the uh, Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery Committee for my first term as state representative. So we're going to kick off with hearings on Monday, and I'm really excited about what we're going to hear about, kind of the ideas that we're going to see. And for me, I'm really interested in the dual diagnosis. So for folks who have mental health uh, disorders and also are struggling with addiction and kind of I think we have a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem did they struggle with addiction and then therefore get a mental health disorder or, or vice versa and we need to figure out how do we educate our community members to really talk about both sides of that and I think it starts early in middle school and high school and making sure our health education curriculum is teaching our kids how to be empathetic to folks struggling with addiction how to talk about uh, those issues and, and also encouraging folks to get into that profession because we have a real need for mental health professionals here in North Central Mass. Mayor Di Natale. Representative, you're absolutely right about the education component. Mm -hmm. I think that's the preventative side of things, attacking the demand. Let's get these young people to know what yeah. are those pitfalls, what to look out for. Mm -hmm. And Cindy, you're absolutely right with the medical marijuana component. Karen Mercasey, she's a doctor, she's a former uh, uh, anesthesiologist, has is one of the uh, CEOs of one of the uh, medical marijuana facilities that are up and running in Fitchburg. Uh -huh. uh, we had a discussion not more than a couple of weeks ago, and that's exactly what we talked about, about medical marijuana taking the place of uh, opioids and, uh, you know, for pain management, Absolutely. things of that nature. So uh, uh, we're hoping that we make, make advances in that direction to address it. 
What we're doing in Fitchburg, we're the leading edge in, in dealing with the treatment side of it, with our relationship with AdCare Hospital in Worcester, along with uh, uh, the district attorney's office. Uh, we have a person on 24 hours, 24 hours a day to go to the emergency room when someone reports with a, an opioid uh, overdose and encouraging them to seek treatment. They don't always avail themselves of it, but uh, that's, I think, on the treatment side. And we're trying to get ahead of it by doing, you know, doing things of that nature. So uh, uh, it's, I, I'm glad, Kevin, you pointed out the fact that this is pervasive. It's everywhere. It's everywhere, not just in the Commonwealth, certainly, but nationally. And uh, uh, it's so important that I think the Baker administration, to their credit, has done a great job with expending, I think, during the, uh, his uh, uh, budget debate, uh, a few more dollars toward uh, the opioid epidemic. So uh, let's hope we can, uh, you know, we can uh, make a dent in that. But again, that education component, mm -hmm. I think, is yeah. you're attacking it before it becomes a problem. That's the important thing. All right, Michael. <clears throat> All great points. It, it, this is such a tough issue. It's such a polarizing issue. We see it that just the, 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 treat, the treatment of this issue, some people want to go on the punishment side, some people want to go on the treatment side. Obviously, you need a balance. Uh, what, what's clear is that over the last 40 years, this war on drugs hasn't worked. It's been a failure. This isn't a war. You can't treat it like a war. Uh, and so it, it's stressing 100% the punishment side. Uh, great points brought up by everybody here that, that there, you need to strike a balance. You need to address the treatment side of this. This is a disease. This is something that needs treatment. Now, when we say that, and this is what I mean by it being such a polarizing issue, when you say that, immediately somebody thinks, oh, well, you want to let them off the hook. You don't want them to be punished for anything they do bad. Well, no, but you have to separate out what's, what's what. Somebody who is abusing themselves with these, with these substances, that's where you need to get to the treatment of the disease side of things. If they are doing something to hurt somebody else, if they are doing something that causes somebody else pain or damage, that's where the punishment side has to come in. Yes, you have to strike a balance, but you can't overlook the fact as to what this is. It's not just a habit. This stuff is so powerful. This stuff is so addictive. It's not just a habit. It's not just a choice. It really has a rise to a level of a disease. That doesn't mean that there aren't punishment. For, there isn't punishment for consequences, but you need to strike that balance. So speaking of that, the balance between punishment and treatment, the city of Gloucester a couple years ago put into place their ANGEL program. And what that is is that if an addict walks into a police station and hands over their drugs and hands over their paraphernalia, they're not arrested. They are assigned what's called a community angel, and that community angel becomes their advocate, seeks a, to get them into a detox, and then after their detox, either a halfway house or a level three um, uh, CC, what is it, CC, CCO program, um, or whatever is available to them. In the Lemons to Fitchburg area, should an addict who wants help be able to walk into a police station, turn in their drugs, and not be arrested? Or do police officers have the obligation to enforce the law? I would think if I were a police officer, you're enforcing the law. Uh, I'm not sure that the... Uh, I'd like to know more about how... Where does that treatment component come in, and how does it work? Uh, you know, I, I remember talking to some pol uh, law enforcement officials that I know about the program in Gloucester. That was about a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. They're running into some problems because they're they're just not finding as many angels as they were hoping for. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Now you've got this individual in the police station. Uh, perhaps they're in the in the process in the midst of overdosing. What do you do? Uh, again, they end up at the emergency room. Mm -hmm. What else are you going to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, maybe Narcan them, but uh, I mean that's not always. Uh, a solution. And this is where we need more rehabs and less jails. Mm -hmm. You know, putting okay. them in jail is not solving the problem, and I think that's where we, yeah. if we could focus and take some of those tax dollars away from the prison system and putting them into a treatment program, even if you need to do, you know, rather than six months in jail, you do six months in a rehab. At least they got a shot. Yeah. And I think you're getting out. to the point that there's not enough time that we're giving folks to kind of get into Absolutely. recovery and stay in recovery and get their life stable. Yeah. If they're in for for a month, it's it's not enough to it's get your enough. life no. together and, and in a place and, and meeting with folks who run some of the methadone clinics around our area. It's just 
they're struggling to get people into a system uh, and, and some stability and get them counselors. I know sometimes it's hard when we're not paying our counselors enough. They kind of get their training, get a few years under their belt, and then go into private care. Uh, because they can make a lot more money there. So how do we how do we incentivize people to stay in, yeah. in these programs? But, but to the mayor's point, and, and it's, again, it's all about striking a balance. Now, if the Gloucester, if the Gloucester program is running into practical problems, they're running into practical problems, and that's something that needs to be adjusted. But I think there is a distinction or a difference that has to be made with somebody that comes in, turns in all their drugs, um, but they didn't just hit up a liquor store, they didn't just commit a crime. Mm. Well, then... You know, what do you gain by somebody who did not, is, is, is all they've, the only crime they've committed is the so-called victimless crime against themselves. What are you accomplishing by throwing them in jail? Mm -hmm. But uh, you see, that wouldn't happen in Fitchburg. Yeah. They wouldn't be thrown in jail. They didn't commit a crime, although illegal heroin use is a crime. They're going to, they're, they're, we're going to find treatment for them. Good. As po Fitchburg police, that's what we're about in Fitchburg. And it's because of, uh, through the efforts of Chief Martin, I'll, you're going to get a more progressive police chief than Chief Ernie Martineau. So uh, we're, we're, not about, we're not about the hammer. We're about the Good glove. to hear. Quickly, we have to get yeah. out of here. Anyone who wants to chime in should knock in. Back in the 80s, we gave out condoms in schools, free condoms in schools to combat the aid crisis. We have an opioid crisis. Do we give out Narcan for free in the schools to students who need it? I don't know about Yes, that. no. Well, you're going to train them how to use it right. and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not I mean, it's I, not a simple thing of here. Yeah. You, you go when you're in trouble. Uh, take it. Uh, yeah, and, and who? Know. I mean, the yeah. training issue, and uh, you know, how, no, one, one Narcan isn't always effective. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as if you're if you're a yeah. daily drug user, do you mm -hmm. give them a week's supply? Who's paying for that? Right. How are they being trained to, to handle that? Mm -hmm. Where do they do it? Yeah. Who's ultimately responsible for that? There's a lot involved in that. I mean, obviously, okay. it should be available, but there's more to it. It's not that simple. According to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, four out of five people who are addicted to opioids began by taking prescription pain medication. Right. Mm -hmm. 259 million prescriptions written in this country last year. A little bottle of pill for, pills for every single American. So, uh, you know, we want to go after the drug pushers wearing the black hoodies. Maybe we should also look at regulating the drug pushers wearing the white coats. Absolutely. We need to take a break, and we'll be right back. Issue two, last November, the voters of Massachusetts and a majority of voters in Lemonster and Fitchburg voted to legalize the sale and regulation of recreational marijuana. It was set to go into effect on December 16th, 2016. That was the date that people voted on. But at the last minute, the legislature pushed through a bill, sent it to Governor Baker's desk, and Governor Baker signed it kicking the can down the road so they can take a look at it and make changes to the law that was passed by voters. And now cities and towns across the Commonwealth, including Lemonster, are looking at moratoriums and some are even looking to opt out. Question for the panel, should politicians, state and local, respect the will of the voters and start getting to work on getting this ready and getting our zoning laws in place? Or should they be rewriting the laws that uh, that the that the people have voted on, Representative Higgins. Yeah, I absolutely think we should be respecting the will of the voters, making sure that what they uh, voted on is respected within our communities. And Lemon Sturt passed. We need to get to work on making sure it's zoned, and we go through the process that we went through with medical marijuana, and that we know that it's in uh, kind of the most appropriate places within our communities. And I'm going to work hard uh, in the state legislature to make sure that the law that comes out looks uh, as close to as what the voters passed back in November. Mayor Di Natale. You know, I, I am, uh, I, I was, I'd be less than truthful. I told you I wasn't a little concerned when this was passed, only because uh, when I was in the legislature, uh, the, the discussion came up on more than one occasion. My response usually at the time was, let's wait to see what the data tells us. Mm -hmm. 
with respect to, to states like Colorado. Uh, I think this, those numbers are starting to come in now with driving incidences, driving under. What, you know, what effect does this have societally? You're not going to change that vote. But, but before I voted back then, that's, those are, that's some of the data that I wanted. Well, now it's done. It's, a, it's the law. So what we're doing in Fitchburg, we're being proactive. We're looking at, uh, I myself am not looking uh, for a, a, a pro prohibition on these kinds of facilities, but we're more concerned with controlling where they end up. So we're looking at that zoning component and placing them in more commercial retail areas where they should be. So, so again, so we have control over where they are and they just don't pop up uh, nilly-willy. So um, that's it. But again, the will of the people, they've spoken. And uh, I think what we need to do now is uh, move forward with regulations that make sense. Michael. And, and the mayor brings up a good point uh, in terms of zoning. I mean, that's, that's something that's within a uh, municipality's police power to do right. to make sure. And, and you do that with any type of use. You do exactly. that with retail stores. You do that right. with anything. That's right. Any any legal use, liquor, whether it be liquor stores, whether it just be uh, retail in general, or, or factories. Okay, perfectly legal things. But where I draw the line is any of these any of these attempts to slow things down. Well, just so we can study the studies. Just you know, people who have this puritanic attitude towards. Look, I don't, I don't smoke the stuff. I'm not into the stuff. But with that said, you know, you have to draw a line between the, what marijuana is and what some of the awful things we've talked about in the last segment are. Okay, and people just aren't doing that. Our attorney general is not drawing a line. The the, the uh, you know the United States attorney general is not drawing a line between them. Okay, but we have to. Okay, and that is the will of the voters. The voters have spoken. So you want to regulate it as part of your ordinary police power. That's fine. But enough of these dragging your feet just for because you have an ulterior motive. You know, if you don't like the stuff, don't smoke it. Don't do it. Don't eat brownies with it in it. But you know what? You don't want you don't want to thwart the will of those who passed it and said, you know, this is what this is what we want, and it's realistic. It's reasonable. Cindy. Well, I have very strong feelings on this topic. I've thought a lot about it, and um, I, it should be legal. I've felt that way for a very long time. I find it's far less dangerous than alcohol. Uh, I think it obviously can be re regulated. The revenue that the state could get from this is astronomical. We need the funds. You're not going to stop people from smoking pot. If you smoke pot right now, you're smoking pot right now. So you're either going to buy it off the street or you're going to buy it legally in a store. Um, so we're missing an opportunity, I think. The, the state in general, um, the revenues, I, I'd rather see it controlled. I'd rather see get the drug dealers off the street and people be able to go into a store and buy it in a you know, similar quantities or whatever like you would alcohol. And um, you know what they do in the privacy of their own home is what they do. Um, if you think that somebody's going to, all of a sudden crime's going to go up because people are going to start smoking pot now, that's not going to happen. The people who smoke pot are smoking pot already. And it should be legalized, and it, we need to move forward with it. So the advocates of the marijuana question, question three last year, put together a law. It was all written out. Voters had an opportunity to read the law and then vote on it. Some of the things being considered uh, by the legislature right now to change the law that was voted on by the people, uh, the people voted that households can grow up to 10 marijuana plants. Uh, the Senate is advocating that home growing uh, creates difficulties for a seed to sale tracking system and is recommending and uh, raising the possibility of outlawing home growing or at least creating a uh, registration system and allowing cities and towns to opt out. Uh, they're also considering raising the age to 25 years old in order to uh, possess marijuana. Stanley Rosenberg, the Senate president, says that there is a large body of scientific research that documents that brain development through adolescence and up to age 25. The voters voted for up to a 12% sales tax. Um, the, the legislature is looking to raise that. The voters said that a person may uh, possess 10 ounces inside of their home, one ounce outside of their home, the legislature is looking for a one ounce maximum possession no matter where that person is. Question is, and I've been voting since 1988, 
Voters voted for the death penalty, we don't have the death penalty. Voters uh, voted for term limits, we don't have term limits. Voters voted to ra- roll back taxes, we, don't ha- we haven't rolled back the taxes. And uh, voters have now voted to, for this law, and the legislature is going to do what they want. Quick question, because we have to get out of this. Uh, we, should we even have referendums um, uh, if we're not going to respect the will of the people, if they're just going to be uh, giving people the illusion they have a choice? Or should we put in laws the way that they were implemented by the people, and if it was a mistake, then the people can repeal it at the next election cycle. Uh, I absolutely think we should have referendums. I also think we need to give the legislature some ability to be able to make tweaks to make sure that it's going to work within the scheme of all of the other laws that exist. I can only speak for myself. I am going to fight to make sure that you can still home grow, you can home brew in Massachusetts. So I don't understand what the difference would be that you, I don't understand some of the, the pushback. I understand issues about uh, questions about young people using. I mean, we have the the limit on alcohol is age 21. We don't push that to 25, even though we know that it's not good for young people. Younger people are more likely to binge drink and do more damage to themselves. So I think this is a larger community conversation and one of the important parts of referendums to spark us to kind of get a gauge of where we are. And it pushed the legislature to act when I don't think that they were ready to act just yet. Monday, May 8th, 6 p.m., Fitchburg State University, Representative Stephen Hay, who is a member of the Joint Committee on Marijuana Policy for the state, will be holding a public hearing, and you can give your state representative feedback. Again, that's May Monday, May 8th, at Fitchburg State University at 6 p.m. We need to take another break. We'll be back in about 30 seconds. Ashley, what are you doing? <laughs> Issue three, also on a referendum last November, voters said no to expanded charter schools in the state. But in that same election, on the federal level, we elected an administration that does support vouchers and public money for private schools and an education secretary who also wants to proceed with that. So uh, the question to the panel is, your thoughts on school funding as it uh, as it pertains to charter schools and also a more generalized area, should there be public funds available for private and parochial schools? I'm, I'm an advocate of the public schools. And uh, like we talked about with the marijuana efforts and attempts to essentially impose your own will on, on things by, by making exceptions or carving this out or carving that out. Well, that's exactly what you're seeing with the public schools. And it starts, you know, the... the, 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 the the fish rots from the head down, and so you're seeing this with our Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Education, uh, Betsy DeVos, who, if she had her way, there wouldn't be any more public schools. Okay, she's not going to get her way, and we're going to have public schools, but we have to be extremely careful. I understand, uh, I understand the the merit the the merit of charter schools. I understand the, the 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 advantages of charter schools, but at the same time, we can't be funding these things to the detriment of our public schools. We just can't do it. We cannot risk destroying what's there. This is America. This is the United States of America. We need to have our public schools. That's that's what we are. Okay. Mayor Di Natale. The, uh, uh, the point you're making, Mike, is absolutely uh, the accurate one. My, my issue in, uh, uh, in some of the public discussions I've had has been just that. Until we alter the funding mechanism for charter schools, public schools, uh, I can't be in favor of that. We're drawing from our existing public schools that are restricted, or I should say bound, to provide education to all. Not charter schools, some charter schools don't have that, that restriction, that obligation, if you will. Mm-hmm. In the city of Fitchburg, you add another charter school to my already existing public school system, and that is probably a bet over a million dollars it's going to cost the school system, where am I getting that from? I'm taking it from those existing schools. Mm-hmm. So until that funding formula is altered and changed to work, and, I, and I'm all for choice, giving people choice, that's wonderful. But again, 
If you want choice and innovation, it's already existing in the Fitchburg Public Schools. We don't need another charter school. Excellent. Representative Higgins. I absolutely agree. Public funds should go to public schools only, and charter right. schools are educating and getting to hand pick kind of the students and push right. the, the students that are yeah. a little more costly to educate back into the public school system when they've already took, taken dollars out. And, and we have some really amazing innovation schools in the city of Lemonster within the school district that are not out of district charter schools, and we've figured out a way to make that work within our school budget, and I think that's really important. We should use that as a model to others that we can have that innovation we can have that flexibility, but still have it be a public school. I absolutely agree with everything that was just said. Uh, the one thing that I would note is I do not advocate public funds going to private schools or parochial schools. Uh, if you want your children to go to those schools, then you provide the funds. Public funds are for public schools, and right now, that's until we figure out other alternatives, as Stephen said, that's the way we have to go. Applications for charter schools in the Boston area have more than doubled this year, shattering previous records. The 16 charter schools collectively received 35 thousand applications for about 2,100 openings. That tells me that there's a perception problem that the public schools mm -hmm. have that we mm -hmm. need to work on. So hopefully uh, if that can be worked on and we can deal with the perception, hopefully this won't be an issue. Exit question. Summer's coming. When, we have, uh, when summer comes, we go to the beach. What do we bring to the beach, Cindy? A book. We bring a book. Cindy is correct. Now, for our viewers at home, Cindy does have it in the contract that she has. To, we have to let her be right once per episode. So thank you for bearing with us as we uh, as we got that out of the way. So, uh, Representative Higgins, what book should people bring to the beach? Uh, I'm really excited. There are two books that have actually been made into a, a movie and a TV series. Um, the Handmaid's Tale, for folks who haven't seen it since uh, it came out in 1985, eerily uh, feels like things that could be happening right now in our community. Uh, and also the circle, if you are interested in kind of what technology is doing and thinking about if Amazon and Google and Facebook joined forces, a little scary. It has Tom <laughs> Hanks and Emma, Emma Watson in the movie. I recommend you read the book first and then go check out the movie. Mayor Di Natale. You know, to be timely and, and on point, we were talking about the op opioid mm -hmm. epidemic, Dreamland. Sam Quinones' book, yep. uh, Dreamland. I had the opportunity of meeting him, and I've just begun to read the book, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. Quite a quite a work on on uh, the whole genesis of the uh, heroin presence in this country. Excellent, Michael. I'll give Donald Trump some uh, some, some some props here. We'll, we'll say uh, we'll say uh, bring bring a copy of the Art of the Deal to the Beast. Just as a as a uh, as as a tribute to Mr. Trump, I got dressed this morning. I have a little surprise here for the folks here. <laughs> See, in honor of Mr. Trump. I have a scotch tape tie because I was getting dressed and my little uh, thing came off oh, here. So, oh, so to good. hold my tie in place here, I, I don't know if the camera can get us close <laughs> yeah. up of that, but uh, you know, I'm silent in here for the uh, inaugural flap show. So. Any, anything can be fixed with tape, right? Exactly, exactly. A little bit of Duck scotch tape. tape will fix the entire country that way. <laughs> Duck tape. Cindy. I would recommend a book. Uh, it's called The Swamp, and it's about uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, a lot of corruption, and about how the swamp really does need to be drained, uh, and that should be entertaining. 112263, a book by Stephen King. It melds in a lot of different things, historical fiction, um, uh, looking and exploring alternative history, what would have happened if John F. Kennedy was not assassinated. Mm. Um, it's a great book and written in a way only Stephen King can write it. It is a long book. It's 1,000 pages, so it's probably the only book you're going to be able to read at the beach, but thank you all anyway. Uh, but 112263 is the book you should bring to the beach. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. That's going to wrap up our show. We're going to be back next time. In the meantime, join us on Facebook, Fitchburg, Lemonster, All Politics uh, on Facebook. Join your friends, your family, your neighbors in that group. We'll talk about politics 24-7. And remember, it's not just enough to be informed. You need to be engaged in order to make change. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Bye. And that's it.